Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, second uh, run through of our Excalibur update, uh, Project XPR. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, behind the scenes today, or first of all, I guess uh, my name is Shane Griffith. I'm the product manager of, of 3ds Max and Max Design. Um, also on the phone today, and uh, we'll be uh, joining in part of the presentation. We have Ian Neese, which is our product design lead. Uh, Kelsey Simpson will be available online at points to answer questions, um, and Sergio Mucino will be available. Uh, later in the presentation uh, to talk about a particular portion of Excalibur also. Um, in addition, we have uh, Ken Pemetel, Director of uh, Product Management, uh, Claude Robillard, our Senior Development Manager, uh, Pierre Felix uh, Breton is a uh, Product Designer for both Max and Max Design. Uh, all of uh, these individuals all work on the product line. Uh, Jody Anderson, which you'll hear from uh, time to time throughout the broadcast today, uh, is our product marketing manager. Um, and Alice Palmer is also um, uh, joining in online to answer questions as a product marketing manager. So a few housekeeping things um, about uh, the GoToMeeting, if you're not familiar with it. We are uh, broadcasting voice over IP or through uh, a dial-in number on the audio, so hopefully you have your speakers adjusted and you can hear me just well. Um, it is better to use a 1280 by 1024 or larger uh, resolution. This will enable you to see the presentation and um, answer any questions that might come up. Um, and then we will be recording this, this session, um, and we hope to follow up with an email tomorrow to let you know how to uh, download or view the recording of the presentation. Throughout the presentation, uh, you may ask us uh, questions. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a number of people behind the scenes that will be answering questions uh, as I, I am presenting or as Ian is presenting or Sergio. Um, we'll kind of control the pace of that because sometimes it can get too hectic if uh, there's a lot of questions and answers going back and forth. We want to make sure that we're not causing a disruption there. Uh, to ask a question, just click on the orange arrow of the sidebar for your GoToMeeting if you've uh, maximized it at this point. Um, and then you should see a questions panel where you can type in your question uh, to our staff behind the scenes, um, and we'll try to do our best to keep up with them uh, throughout the presentation. Before we get started, uh, we are showing uh, forward-looking uh, ideas and thoughts that we have on the on the product line itself. Uh, so I'm required to read these statements uh, from our lawyers. We may make statements regarding planned or future development efforts for our existing or new products and services. These statements are not intended to be a promise or guarantee of future delivery of products, services, or features, but merely reflect our current plans, which may change. Purchasing this decision should not be made based upon reliance of these statements. The company assumes no obligation to update these forward-looking statements to reflect events that occur or circumstances that exist or change after the date on which they were made. So it, it's important to note that we do these presentations um, in front of our customer base to understand if we're going in the right direction, and this is why we clearly state that things may change, um, and that's based upon the feedback that we receive. Um, from you. So please don't make any purchasing decisions on this information because um, there is a high probability that things will change. Uh, some of the things, um, because this is a non-NDA uh, type of presentation, there are a lot of ground rules of what we can and cannot discuss um, in the world of uh, revenue accounting. Um, so we cannot discuss uh, existence of future you know, product or features, so we won't be talking about particular releases or specific features. Uh, we'll mainly be showing you our vision or our ideas of what we think is, um, is possible, um, and also what we think uh, you know, a lot of other customers have told us is a good idea. So we're really here to, to validate that and understand if you think that we're also going in the right direction or not. Uh, we'll talk about phases of Excalibur, and I'll get more into that as we get to the XBR slide. So this is not equal to a particular release. It's very important to note that, and we'll show you uh, where we think we are um, in the overall three-phase uh, goals that we have for Excalibur. 
So the agenda for today, I'll first take you through some of the survey data that we've captured um, over the course of the last couple months um, on the public forums. Um, and then I'll uh, give you a little bit of a snapshot of where we're at uh, stability-wise and some of the things that we're doing there to address those concerns. Uh, we'll take you through a summary of what is uh, XBR, Excalibur at the high level and some of the goals that we're trying to achieve with the overall project. Um, and then the bulk of the presentation today is to update you on three specifics of Excalibur, uh, the UI, graphics, and simulation components. Uh, to give you a little bit more insight of uh, some of the things that we're researching in those areas and the ideas that we have where we could go long term on those particular components. In the end, we'll take uh, open Q&A where I will probably read through a few questions live on the air. Um, and we'll also have a number of people online typing and responding to questions uh, more quickly at that point in time. So this is a snapshot of some of the data um, that I mentioned that we received through customers. We had over uh, 1,500 of you take part in this survey. Um, if you're curious to dive into more of the results, Ken has posted a lot of this information on his blog listed in the, the lower left-hand corner there. Um, there's also a link to um, take part in the survey. I think we still have it live at this point. Uh, but out of that data, out of the 1,500 users, we've had over 700 of them that represent the latest release, and we've kind of filtered that data um, to show what the kind of the current uh, top issues are of you know those of you that are using the latest release of the product, um, and to map it to the top three things over here on the on the upper right, we have viewport responsiveness and performance, user interface experience, um, and just overall general application performance. Um, and these three things are three th things that we'll talk to you about today on what we're trying to achieve with Excalibur. So a lot of these things that we're, we're seeing as top problems and issues amongst the users are what we're, we're trying to target with Excalibur um, and some of the things specifically today that we'll talk to you about. But first and foremost, we have to make sure that we move into Excalibur with a very conservative approach. Basically, we two situations we want to avoid. We want to avoid our users having to completely relearn the application because we've changed it drastically. We also want to don't want to have the application uh, come to a complete failure in the sense that there is so much instability that a particular release is completely unusable um, by the vast majority of our users. So we pay a very high attention to stability and quality as we go through any release cycle development. Um, and we really shifted things around within the last three releases to put this first and foremost um, in the development cycle. Um, so starting with the 2009 release, we transitioned to the point where uh, we put all legacy defects and issues at the first part of the development cycle. So before we did any new feature work, we were first going back and trying to fix as many of the, the customer reported problems as, as we had in queue um, in our database. Um, and we've been targeting upwards of 300 plus defects for the last three releases in that area. Um, and we're continuing that with the MAX 2011 release that, that was released uh, in April last year. We also have a high level of uh, commitment to the CER system. This CER stands for Customer Error Report and is a dialog box that shows up when the application fails um, to the point where it exits to the desktop. Um, so it's important to us that customers submit this information because we drive a lot of the, the unknown crashers and a lot of the areas that have been very difficult for us to track down with regular QA testing um, and get in there and solve a lot of these random fixes. So each release we target anywhere from 30 to 35 percent of that CER data to be fixed. Um, and we've been roughly overachieving that at about 37 to 40 percent in the last couple of releases. Um, and at the bottom down there, down here, you can see kind of where I took some snapshots of, of the CER data, of where we stand today. And currently, we're seeing about a little over 100,000 reports come in on the 2011 release, uh, which is coming from uh, an install base of, uh, you know, roughly 500,000 plus users out there. So you can see there's large amounts of data that we have to work with. And that data gets consolidated based on where the application failed and the information stored in those reports uh, to what we call buckets. And that represents uh, roughly 17,000 buckets. And of those, we're currently standing at a point of about 22, 23 percent 
uh, fixed. And so we're on track to, to meet our goals there. The interesting thing this release is that the buckets are rather small in comparison to any other release. Um, so we have only five buckets that are larger than, five, than 1 percent of the total um, percentage of reports. Um, so this means that there's a lot of unique uh, random areas of the application that are failing and it makes it much harder uh, to go in there and fix any one problem that fixes everything. Um, but we have been able to consolidate and categorize some of those uh, to be particular issues with either out of memory or external plugins and, and uh, I took some more data there to give you an idea of uh, at the high level some of the other uh, common concentration points. So these are all things that are under the radar for us, uh, continue to be of, of high importance and high priority. And again, they, this is really what uh, uh, governs what we can do with any feature development or forward-looking research along Excalibur and other items. Um, so we want to make sure that we're putting a quality product out on the street first and foremost. So what is Excalibur? Project Excalibur is focused at these four main goals. Um, first is scalability and performance. Um, this really talks to um, the inability that we have today to scale very well with the hardware changes that are occurring. Uh, so many customers are, are out there today um, using eight cores or plus. And, and throughout the application, many cases, it's only using one of those eight cores. So we want to make sure that we're leveraging the hardware to the fullest whether it be on the CPU side or the GPU side. So we're, we're really looking to do a number of things at the foundational level to make the application more scalable with these hardware changes. On top of that, we want to make it easier for the users to go from point A to point B. Um, so this is about creating more friendly uh, UI workflows, uh, more responsive, um, and more innovative workflows. So we want to make sure that you know we're not just reducing the number of mouse clicks, but we're also creating new opportunities to visualize the workflow in different ways. So this talks to um, some of the node-based workflows uh, on the UI side. Um, and then lastly, we want to make sure that uh, the data management is, is easier to understand and to work with. Uh, scenes are, are certainly getting larger and larger every day. Um, and we need to make sure that you're able to, to work with these large, complex scenes, uh, not only on an individual basis, um, by streaming in data or by, you know, segmenting it to, to only, you know, visualize a portion of it in one particular viewport versus the other, uh, but also how you collaborate on that one scene. So we have multi-user environments that need to all work together on one particular shot or scene. Um, we need a ways to break that up so that everyone can tap in and contribute to that project. And the how is, is the critical point here, and the reason why um, you know we are you know somewhat uh, you know taking a while to get some of these things implemented, um, but the reality is we don't want to break the workflow. We want to make sure that we can keep you productive throughout all these changes. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, X, X, Excalibur transitions the product uh, to something that lives up to those goals, but is still the product that you know and love. We really don't want to drastically change things. So underneath of those goals, we have these six targeted uh, initiatives. Um, today, I will be talking about UI, graphics, um, and simulation, um, along with Ian and Sergio. Um, but uh, there are other areas of focus, including diet, which is targeted at reducing uh, the memory footprint, um, deferred loading of plugins, um, and just overall memory management and startup times. Um, there's another uh, project associated to document views and how you manage that data and, and work with, uh, you know, consolidating and, and manipulating large amounts of objects um, from a, a workflow standpoint. And then there's also data management um, and thinking about how we uh, reference data, um, segment data in the .max file itself, open the .max file up, and so on. So where do we stand kind of coming into the presentation today? Uh, we really think that we're, we're nearing completion um, or getting closer to phase two at this point. Certain things uh, like document views are, are very early in research stage. Um, and other things 
uh, like graphics um, and diet are, are much further along in the process at this point in time. Um, so this is kind of a snapshot of where we think we are. We certainly have a ways to go. Um, there's a lot of things that haven't surfaced yet um, in a, in a fe as a feature in a product release, and many of these things have been going undergoing um, development over the last uh, three or four years in certain cases. Um, so there's a lot of things that you won't necessarily see um, at a surface level for, for some time yet. Um, some things that have surfaced, though, um, on the UI side is the Slate Material Editor. Um, this is really one of the key things in the UI. Uh, we won't talk to it specifically today, but it is involved in the, into the project in the sense that we want to make sure that we create um, these really rich node-based workflows for working with, um, you know, uh, modifier stacks, um, render elements. There's a lot of different areas where you can be creative and innovative about how you use a node-based workflow. Uh, today, it primarily only sits inside of Material Editor. We want to expand that um, and also consolidate the other node-based interfaces like Schematic View and Particle Flow and others uh, to use one common interface. On the graphics side, I'll be talking about uh, Quicksilver that was released in 2011 um, and how that's transitioning uh, through the research that we're doing to become the new viewport engine. On the data management side, uh, we've been doing a number of things here um, that many of you might not be aware of, um, especially when it comes to the .max file itself. Uh, the .max file is no longer um, a complete closed black box. Uh, there's portions of the .max file that you can read um, through scripting mechanisms outside of Max entirely. So there's things that you can do like repath textures, um, repath other dependencies without even loading the file into Max. Um, and this is a this is a trend that we want to see continue in opening up that format to be more accessible um, and more flexible beyond uh, what the, the product needs it to do inside that its own database. Um, and then we've been uh, doing a number of uh, releases focused to containers and continuing to uh, reinvent that re referencing workflow that we have in the product today. Um, and we have a lot a lot left to do there yet, too, and there's a lot more plans to continue there, but we won't have time to go into that today. On the last subject, uh, Sergio will talk more about this later on. Uh, we've recently released uh, the PhysX uh, plugin. Uh, as a subscription extension for the 2010 release, or 2011 release, I'm sorry, um, in September last year. Um, and this is really the foundation for what we want to do with XBR simulation. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ian Neese, um, and he's going to take you through some of the ideas and the vision that we have for the UI. Um, and uh, I'll hand it over to him. Thanks. Hello everyone, uh, this is Ian, and as Shane said, I'm going to talk about the Max UI. Uh, first, I'm going to sort of set up some challenges that we face with the UI, many of which will be familiar to you because it comes from your feedback. Then we'll sort of frame the design um, tenets that we're approaching it with and talk about some ideas that we think will meet those challenges. And then finally, I'll take a few minutes to click through a prototype that sort of connects some of the ideas together so you can see um, how it looks. So challenges. 3ds Max is good enough. We hear this uh, periodically. Uh, we're basically saying here that the foundation is in place for a lot of you, you know, and the, the, the big tools that you need to get your daily work done are there. Similarly, everything I need was in Max 8 or Max 9 or Max 10. So we make incremental improvements every time, and they're targeted, and, and they are improvements. Um, but again, the, you may spend a lot of your day in uh, legacy functionality that has been there since Max 8 or before. So as we add value, um, we sort of by definition add complexity. And you know the new functionality again is good, and, and there are you know great reasons for putting it in there. But the UI, you know, the resulting UI may not be as consistent as we would like it to be. And so, for example, here's some sort of targeted, targeted improvements that we've made, um, and they are targeted, and, and they, they, they did offer improvement. But if you sort of imagine what each of these things looks like and think about the UI, there's, a, sort of, there's the inconsistencies, you know, become obvious. So as you all probably know very well, as uh, 
complexity builds up, you know, and uh, and you're trying to get your work done, the UI builds up in front of you, and pretty soon your content is totally obscured, or can be, depending on what you're doing, and uh, you can't find stuff, or stuff is hard. It's hard to make stuff come and go right when you need it. There's a lot of stuff in your way. And for new users, it's um, it's hard to know um, how to get something done if you're coming from uh, you know different applications um, for different reasons. Like you want to bring import some data and render data, or if you want to just explore what you can do in Max, it's hard to find out how to do that. And, and often the, the means for doing that are spread across the uh, application. So this statement is probably not true across the board, but we're trying to be tough on ourselves in, uh, in, in our approach to the UI. And of course, we need to qualify it. What may look complicated to some actually is organized perfectly to others. Uh, so you know, all of you sort of know when, where to find the stuff that you need. Uh, you have many streamlined ways of working, even in this sort of complex application. And a lot of the stuff in the UI works and works well and, and has always worked well, and we don't want to disregard that. So in other words, you want to be very careful. We don't want to clean your garage, and we're not trying to disrupt your ways of working by any means. This is all aimed at uh, improvement. So now I'm going to frame the design approach that we're taking. Uh, number one, we would like users to be able to direct stuff, direct things that they want to do, meaning really, you know, as much interaction in the canvas as possible, uh, focus on modelessness, so things are just there, you know, all the time you need them, and avoid sort of interrogating you with dialog boxes and error messages and, and just a lot of things to read and, and figure out. So you don't want to, you don't want to have a conversation with the application, <laughs> you want to tell the application what to do. There you go. And on a similar note, keeping the focus on the content, which which means in the canvas and the viewport, obviously, but it also means on the, the tools that you need when you need them. Number three is really about discovering or being able to discover tools uh, so you can find them when you need them, um, and so you can learn the application more easily and develop sort of the muscle memory and the, the familiarity um, that you need to be more efficient when you're working. And number four is really for new users, but it's for everyone. Um, just we want to limit the set of choices, you know, just to the ones that are critical for the task at hand. Until you need more choices, that is. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, we want to we want Max to be Max. We know um, we want people to be familiar with the UI when they come in from AutoCAD or coming from Maya. But there's a difference between consistency and um, and making the application just homogenous. And, and we're not trying to match any other application. Max is Max, and we love it, and has all, all of its strengths are, will be intact no matter what we do with the UI. And um, so there's a reason to come into Max, and that's going to be very clear in the UI. It has to be. And finally, the whole point of this is really to increase your efficiency. We want, this, we want you to love working with the application. We want it to be fun. Um, and if something new is in there, uh, UI-wise, we want it to be worth learning. You know, that's it's that simple. We want you to we want you to want to to learn it and and use it. So now we'll go through some ideas that we have um, about about UI. First, being aesthetics, Max should be pretty uh, to look at. It should be clean and consistent, and because um, that would make it, it just makes it more pleasant to work with. Simple as that. Right now, it's it's inconsistent. Right now, we think in many ways. A lot of you work with multiple monitors, um, and the program isn't really designed for that. And we think it'd be great to sort of just to really understand multiple monitors and um, and design around them. And in so doing, we would need um, perhaps multiple application frames. So you know what parts of the UI are on what monitor, and uh, they would they would be consistent in that respect, and they would know when you had one monitor, two monitors, three monitors, and things would sort of dock and be manageable across those monitors. 
And sort of docking in general is something we uh, we think is really cool and, and we like to look at because as yeah, some of the earlier pictures showed, the, the UI gets polluted kind of quickly as things pile up. And a lot of it's unnecessary in, you know, in many cases and many tasks that you're doing. So it would be great to have sort of, again, focus on modelessness and, and a way to sort of make things consistent and give them permanent homes and have them come and go when you need them and where you need them. So all this could add up to the ability to um, sort of choose what kind of workspace that you want and maybe choose a few different workspaces and, and sort of toggle between them. So if you, maybe you're mostly animating, but you do a little uh, tweaking, uh, you know, at the, of the, uh, the armpits or the shoulders as your character is moving around, you might probably want an animation workspace, and maybe you want to pop over to a modeling workspace. You want the views to be there and the tools to be there um, in those workspaces, and probably not a lot of anything else. So, for example, we have a, a little sketch of an animation workspace, which can be very simple. You know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, you guys use sort of a simple set of tools you know, for, for task, and we'd like to isolate those tools, present them nicely. Uh, we have a command panel, as you all know, which is a, a start of a properties panel or properties editing UI, and we think it could be a better properties editing UI, meaning sort of everything that's selection sensitive, including materials, could load into the, into the properties panel, and perhaps things that aren't selection sensitive don't have, you know, don't live in the command panel and live somewhere else. Status is something that Max reports inconsistently, we think. Um, there are lots of different statuses, like are you missing plugins, are you missing bitmaps, um, are you in, are you in uh, soft selection mode, you know, that kind of stuff. It would be cool to sort of see the history of your status um, as, as you're moving through your scene and have access to maybe some um, options for each status, like is snaps on, is soft selection on, and what are the options for that. And, and, and um, that is, uh, and, you know, obviously housed in one sort of consistent and uh, easy to find place. Scene management is critical, and it is, it's, it's kind of a balance between uh, is it a sort of an uber spreadsheet view of, your, of all your scene, or is it just a quick way to, to find and select things, you know, depending on what you're doing? And, you know, so, so is it, meaning is it a system or is it a UI widget? And it's kind of both, and um, we think we need to take a good look at that, and it would be cool to uh, improve it. So um, on the, the topic of uh, sort of new users particularly, we, we think that entry points for tasks are really important. Um, and that's where this one main ribbon comes in. But also for experienced users, we think sort of intelligent grouping of your controls is, would be a great boost to efficiency. So we think a, a, a tabbed system, like a main ribbon, that sort of lays out the different tasks um, and the tools associated with them, and then as entry points for those tasks, would be really valuable no matter what kind of a user you are. Which isn't to say that we're going to be able to sort of have everything accomplishable in the ribbon, but you'll, you'll be able to discover where the tools are that you need for a given task, and they'll be organized correctly. And if it needs to lead you to the command panel or lead you to the viewport or lead you somewhere else, that's fine. But you build, it's like a little narrative that tells you what, uh, how, to, how to accomplish each task. And along with that, when you sort of launch things, um, tools, you know, um, as it is now, it's kind of inconsistent where the options for those tools are. Like the array tool is a good example. It pops up in a little dialog and you have your, all your options there and then you have to dismiss it. It would be great if, if uh, tools were sort of modeless and all their options loaded in the same place no matter what kind of tool you're using. And of course, we want really cool looking icons and text where we think text is appropriate. But just color, um, you know, nice, just the right amount of color, the right amount of 2D versus 3D, and the right amount of icons versus text. We think it's just going to make, you know, back to the aesthetics thing, it's going to make it a much more pleasant application to look at. We can sort of uh, make a pass over all that stuff. And big icons. Everyone seems to have enough. Uh, Resolution now on their screen, so you know well, why, why have small buttons? Basically, it'd be cool to have big, easy to find things and easy to hit. So when you're flying around doing stuff, you can just you can hit them without thinking about it.
we've there's a um, we've done sort of sort of a lot of discussing and and polling about what people change when they open the application, and it's it's amazing how how many people say they start Max and the first thing they do is change A, B, C, and D. So we really like to just get that figured out and make sure that for any user, the that you don't have to do that. You just open it and your set your defaults are there because they make sense for what you're doing. Max is uh, complicated, as we all know, and it's it's often the case that it takes a while to set something up um, to um, basically to get to get to the point where you can be creative uh, in a given task. And we think it'd be cool to have content galleries that were that basically made it so you're not starting from scratch. And there's sort of a wide range of ideas for this. It could be setting up you know, particle effects like tornadoes and you let you plug in your stuff in, into them or setting up lighting schemes if you want to sort of get into product um, rendering. And you know there, there are a lot of ways of doing this. It could really be endless and it could be a user fed kind of a thing. Just so when you open Max you could you could explore things that you don't know. You could start something that you need to work on somewhere with this with a setup that saves you a lot of time and makes it more fun. So now I'm going to take over I think and just click through a, a little mock-up that we made that just sort of connects some of those ideas together. Let's see. There's this, and I'm showing this. And, and I guess I'm showing now. So this is a mock-up we made just to connect some of the ideas together, as I said. And here we have some sort of persistent UI up on the top, traditional kind of a toolbar. And we have the entry points here, the ribbon I was talking about. And these these names are, you know, none of this is final, obviously, but these names, this is just a stab at, here's, a, here's one way to break it down, one way to slice it. You know, hey, I want to create stuff. I want to insert data from somewhere else. I want to manipulate stuff that I already have. And on and on, I want to texture, I want to animate. I want to, I want to check out particles. I don't even know anything about particles. I want to see if there's nothing in there. <laughs> um, so that's that's the idea. And and this is this will be the entry points to all the parts of the UI and to the power use of the UI. On the left here, we have... Uh, some sort of a, an idea about docking, where you say this is you know, a scene explorer type of thing, but it just sort of says, hey, this maybe there's a better way for this kind of stuff to come and go. I just wave over it, and it comes and goes. Um, and this could be like CUI, it could be anything hosted in there, but it just sort of, it was, it's, a, it's a cooler sort of minimize, maximize mechanism. And down on the bottom left here, we have uh, some viewport layouts at your fingertips. So maybe you can just create the ones that you need it's a top view with the right shading. It's a camera view with its wireframe for whatever reason. And then you can save them quickly and then add another one here. And then you know when you're going to pop to another view exactly what you're going to get. On the right here, we have the properties panel uh, idea, which has you know the some sort of a modifier stack looking thing here. And then uh, materials added over there. And there's some, you know, there, this is obviously just a, Quicky kind of a mock-up, just to explore. So it's not complete or anything. But if you if you th think about sort of setting all this stuff up the way you want it, and then setting it up again, you could easily switch between different different workspaces like this, and um, and get different tasks done more efficiently. And that is it for the UI. Thanks for listening. All right, thanks, Ian. Let me take back over control. <clears throat> and I've been chatting too much and trying to keep up here. All right, so what we'd like to do is uh, take a quick poll here, and I'm going to hand it over to Jody to explain to you the process and where it's at. All right, so we've got a couple of polls um, that we're going to conduct throughout this webinar today, and the goal is really just to see if we're moving in the right direction. So. I've launched the first poll. It's what do you think of our UI vision? So everyone can go ahead and select on an answer that represents their feelings. And um, then we'll, after we close the poll, I'll share the results with everyone. So we'll give a couple of seconds uh, time for everyone to get their votes in. And like I said, we'll have a couple more polls throughout this session. and. We really appreciate your feedback to help us validate the direction in which we're going with 3ds Max. So
So it looks like nearly everyone has had a chance to vote. So I'm going to go ahead and share the results. Everyone can get an idea of the general thought behind uh, how we're feeling about the UI vision that was just shared. Thanks, Jody. Um, looking pretty good. I just want to remind everybody on the questions that are coming in. Uh, you know, a lot of things uh, we we can't really answer specifically, so please understand that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to stop you from asking them, but just don't feel too disappointed if we don't answer them. Um, and we're going to, we're trying to answer them as as much as possible out there. So next, I want to talk about Excalibur graphics um, and what we're trying to do with this particular initiative. Um, quite a while ago, this was one of the first uh, parts of Excalibur that we started doing research on. Uh, roughly, oh gosh, I think it's been three or four years ago at this point. Um, and the goal was, is is really to re-architect a new viewport uh, system in a way that frees us from a lot of hardware limitations that we have today. So today, the, the current current viewport system is limited. Um, in the fact that it can only allow four cameras. Um, so we can never do more than four viewports for current architecture. Uh, we're also limited in the fact that the current viewport uh, system is all contained within the main, uh, the main evaluation thread of the application. Um, so what this means is that as, as you do functions with inside the application, the viewport has to finish its draw loop before you can continue on doing another function. So the architecture of, of this project was structured in a way um, to separate that from the main scene graph of the application. Um, so our goal is to, to create a system that can function more as a client uh, to the Mac server database where changes are occurring in the server uh, by the user. Um, for example, you're adjusting a spinner on a modifier. Those changes are then relayed to the viewport client. Um, but it is constantly trying to keep in sync with what's going on in the main database. So it has its own database to track changes and understand where it's at, um, but independently of the main scene graph. So what we're hoping is this allows uh, a performance gain, not only in, in the fact that we're separated into multiple threads at that point, um, but also in the sense of user interactivity with the application. Um, so as you're adjusting spinners and sliders on things, you're not bothered, bothered, boggled down uh, with particular changes that are going on in the viewport. Um, and the viewport system itself is constantly keeping um, up, to date, up to date as quickly as possible. So as hardware scales, um, as we know it continuously will um, evolve, um, on the GPU side and on the CPU side, we're envisioning with this type of segmentation uh, that will become completely transparent. There will be no gap or delay between what the viewport is doing and, and what you're doing in the main application. The system itself is, as I mentioned, often its own main thread, um, but it's also multi-threaded in itself. Um, so we're trying to, to architect a system that has each viewport in its own thread, um, and then operations inside the viewport itself is multi-threaded. Um, so we're trying to be as, as scalable as, a, as possible with this particular solution. Um, and some of the goals that we're trying to achieve is a minimum of 10x performance gain on scenes with really large object counts, um, performance gains of at least 10x on really large uh, polygon count scenes um, in addition to that. And then on top of that, we want to make sure that the viewports maintain a really high level of quality on the visual side of things, surpassing anything else that is available on the market today. So. What I have here is to show you uh, a video of a prototype. Uh, keep in mind this is playing through the GoTo meeting, so it isn't going to show you the actual performance of, of where we're at today uh, with the research. Um, it is a little chunky on the, on the meeting, um, but what we're showing here is a model of San Francisco that is uh, roughly 6 million polygons, uh, 5,000 objects, uh, displayed in full shaded mode. Uh, the video will transition to wireframe mode here in a second also. Um, but we're also trying to do things with taking it beyond the basic uh, shaded, gray shaded mode. 
um, and introducing all the lighting and shadow capabilities that we have with the product. So adding in uh, rich ambient occlusion, uh, soft shadows, and then be able to adjust those lights uh, dynamically while viewing it in real time or near real time inside the viewport. On the wireframe side, we need to maintain a high level of performance here um, to do intelligent culling on the objects to make sure we're only drawing what's necessary or what's in view at that time. Um, and also um, do an occlusion culling on the polygons themselves. We're also exploring you know, new pixel shaders and things like that that can be applied to the overall viewport. Um, to drive a, a, a different look for design review or other things. Um, here's an example of the, the type of quality that we're targeting with the viewport. Um, very realistic, um, accurate ambient occlusion and, and indirect lighting um, throughout the environment. Some more examples. Let me go ahead and close this out. Uh, some images we've been able to achieve uh, recently with the system, uh, showing that we're kind of really taking this to the next level higher than what we currently um, have implemented in the 2011 release. So Quicksilver, to, to tie this all back together, Quicksilver was really uh, a technology prototype for this new viewport engine. Um, and Quicksilver released in 2011 was uh, released as a, a separate renderer. Uh, but underneath the hood, that was basically a viewport and what we're trying to do overall in the long-term goals here. So we'll pause again a, a second here to capture your thoughts on what you think of XBR graphics. And the polls are now open. Are there any uh, questions, Ken, that you want to pull out for me? I haven't uh, been able to keep up too fast myself. Cat. <clears throat> Cat, uh, what are Max, Max Sharp and Fluids. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK. So I'll, I'll start with Cat. Uh, let's see. What can I say about Cat? So Cat uh, came to us as part of the Softa Monitor acquisition. We added it. Uh, 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 right away as a subscription extension. It was released into the product as a, a full feature in the 2011 release. Um, and we're really um, been behind the scenes, uh, you know, restructuring the code to be more robust for the future. We really think that this is our, our animation system for the future, and we want to make sure that um, the code is there and structured in a way that we can easily modify it and continue pushing it forward. Um, for the most part, uh, we've been uh, releasing various different hotfixes and, and things like that for the code. Um, but behind the scenes, we're really getting it ready for the next big thing. Uh, what was it? I forgot your other ones. <laughs> we'll probably come back to it on the next poll. How about that? Python and or Max Sharp. OK, so Max, so yeah, there's always a lot of interest and, and inquiries for Python um, support. We recently, and also just for better .NET integration itself, too, we have a number of customers pressing uh, things that way in their scripting languages. So we have recently started a research project on ADN um, that is available for any ADN partners to go and explore um, a .NET or C Sharp wrapper that we have for the SDK. Um, this then can be uh, mapped easily to uh, a Python uh, support or wrapper. Um, or you know, for different various different flavors of Python, Iron Python or C Python, uh, it, it's really undetermined at this point in time, and we're really putting it out there to better understand how people would like us to structure this type of thing. So that research is occurring there on the ADN side. We've also uh, released it to our beta form at this time, um, and later on I'll share with you information on how you can join the beta. Okay, so I'm closing the poll, and I'm going to just share out those results. Okay, and then I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jody. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Sergio Machino, which is going to take us through simulation. Okay. 
Um, okay, so can, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what uh, we're looking into and things that we have been researching in the past few months regarding dynamic simulations in 3ds Max. So in, in 3ds Max, there's um, we already have a few tools regarding dynamic simulations. We've been researching a lot into how these tools can be improved and the workflows around them. So our goal with all this would be to have a very tightly integrated environment where all the features um, used very coherent workflows to work together uh, so that this will allow the user to have faster iterations and more interactive feedback regarding the simulations they are working on. To be able to accomplish this, there's, uh, there's a good list of objects uh, of different dynamic entities that we would have to support to, uh, for us to claim that we have a complete solution for dynamics. Um, these objects could include, for example, rigid bodies, soft bodies, uh, ropes and dynamic hairs, particle systems and fluid systems, uh, the forming meshes for, for characters or objects that need to deform in an in, in interactive way within the simulation, and of course, a good number of forces that usually simulations need to, re to rely on, such as gravity, wind, uh, vortex forces, push, etc. So, all this would need to work under an environment that I will go into more detail in, in a little bit uh, along the presentation. The other thing that we want to also work on is um, providing um, something that we're at this point uh, calling a library of physical materials. And the idea behind this is that usually um, when it comes to dynamics, people have to deal with very arcane uh, things, uh, for example, such as friction and density and mass and stuff like that, and they don't really know how to set these values to make an object behave in a certain way that they visualize. So instead of that, we could provide a library of, of uh, physical materials, for example, called something like concrete or rubber or cardboard, and applying one of these physical materials to an object would basically transfer the values the for these physical properties onto the object itself so that it would behave as the material being described. So this would probably um, aid a lot of users who are not familiar with the physical properties in a, in, in a physically correct way to achieve the desired results in a, in a shorter term. Regarding the environment um, where all this would work, uh, what we are trying to do is come up with with an environment where everything is unified and real time. So in this environment, the user would be able to set relationships between objects and determine how these objects interact with one another. So for example, you could say, okay, I want these objects to be live all the time and interact with everything at the same time. Uh, we, could, we could take a pair of objects say only these objects are going to affect these other objects or they're going to be only affected by those objects. So what this gives the user is a lot of control about how the simulation is going to behave and also be able to, um, to be a little bit more, uh, to optimize the, the cost of the uh, computation for the simulation. Um, once this has been set, the, the simulation would, would be always live in the viewport so that the uh, user could see it happening all the time. And the user would also be able to set um, the preview to be the only the simulation or also uh, the keyframe animations that exist in Max as they are today. Um, the user would also be able to turn on or off uh, dynamic states on objects as he says fit. Um, regarding the UI to uh, the dynamic system that we are envisioning, we've looked at several things and as you probably saw in, in, in the previous part of the presentation, we've been putting a lot of effort into coming up with a UI that makes sense for most things and dynamics is, is one of them. And what we want to do is uh, we would like to provide a very simple and unified UI into everything in dynamics working mostly through our viewport systems. So one of the things that, for example, made a lot of sense to us was to look into probably using uh, paint tools to be able to control different parts of the simulation. So you could paint directly 
directly onto objects, physical related attributes. Just for example, if you could paint onto an object different stiffness properties so that if you had a piece of cloth, that you want it to be a little bit more rigid in certain parts than on the rest of the cloth, you can just go ahead and paint that area without having to go to sub-object selections and defining attributes by hand. So that makes a lot more sense for users and it's a very intuitive known workflow. Um, we could also to use our painting tools to, for example, uh, paint fracture points in a fracture system where the painted points would give you a more fragile uh, part of the object so they would fracture more easily and uh, so on we could we could use our paint tools to determine many different parts uh, many different attributes on on the scene that you're working on and the other thing we would uh, we would need to provide is also tools to do some uh, more general scene management and complexity management um, um, things like for example you could use a say just as, as an example an explorer based tool that would allow you to see which objects are currently part of the simulation, which ones are not, uh, divide the simulation by groups, turn on certain groups and turn them off, um, simulate, uh, change states, change uh, and mass editing of properties, etc. So this will allow you to do a, a much more productive scene management uh, of your scene than uh, it would be doing it by hand on a per object basis. Uh, regarding animation workflows, as I mentioned previously, we would be looking at having an environment that is always live. And the user would be able to determine uh, when you play back your scene or go through it uh, through, through the time in your scene, what is it that you want to see. You could, you could be looking at the whole live environment as it is. Uh, you could be looking at the live simulation without keyframe animation or only your keyframe animation if you don't want to see the uh, live dynamics anymore. So all this would happen seamlessly so that uh, you would get the feedback that you need. Um, we could also integrate dynamics into objects in a more interesting way. Uh, what, for example, one possible workflow would be to be able to insert, insert a dynamics layer into cat characters so that at that point in time the cat character would become essentially a dynamic uh, hierarchy of objects such as a ragdoll. The interesting thing about, about conceptualizing this as a layered system is that it will, it will allow users to um, blend the dynamic behavior with, of the character with its previously keyframed or procedural animations. And this could be extended also to, uh, in general, all max objects in itself. Uh, we could have this weighted uh, dynamic system for, for all the objects. Uh, you could also decide to um, capture and, and bake into keyframes things that you're previewing on the fly and maybe interact with these objects directly in the viewport so that you could uh, set up a simulation with certain properties but at simulation time also affect these objects in an interactive way. Um, so those are some of the possibilities that we are looking into with the animation workflows. Finally, one other thing that we've looked into is the possibility of using dynamic systems for modeling workflows. So um, there, are, there are certain things that dynamics could probably bring to the table for dynamic workflows, uh, I mean modeling workflows. And one of them is, for example, um, natural object placement. We, we know that there's lots of users who tend to do scene layout and in most cases, to do object distribution in the scene, they, they tend to rely on, on manual object placement or scattering systems, uh, which sometimes don't give you exactly the results you want and then you need to tweak by hand anyway. So one of the um, things that we could do is enable um, these users to use dynamic simulations to do more natural object placement where they just define uh, certain behaviors, behaviors uh, give their objects initial positions and then just let the dynamic system uh, take care of all the uh, object placement in the scene. The other one would also be for, uh, for example um, doing uh, deformations for modeling purposes but uh, have these deformations be dynamically driven. Um, if you have let's say a, a, a character's a cloth or, or a piece of a curtain or, or a tabletop or something like that, instead of manually modeling by hand all, all the uh, 
little uh, wrinkles and stuff, you could just use a dynamic cloth object, make it simulate, and once it comes to a natural rest state, say, okay, I'm going to keep that. And then if you want, you could uh, continue to use uh, the rest of the modeling tools we provide to uh, fine tune the shape of your ob object. And at this point, I'll give it back to Shane. That's my cue. Thanks, Sergio. So, tell us what you think of simulation. As I try to pluck off some additional questions here. So there's, a, there's actually a good one that just came up. Uh, what does XVR mean for render path management? Uh, so this is actually is under the umbrella of XVR. Um, it's part of the story around what we're trying to do with document views. Um, it's, it's a much bigger concept that I would love to have more time to go into today. But um, as I said, we're very early in the process of researching that, so there's not um, a lot for us to put together in our presentation and at this point in time. Uh, but at the high level goals, we're looking at um, managing the data from end to end. So how you bring it in um, and how you filter the data to work with it as you come in, organize it better within layers um, and other things, um, and then apply overrides to it to do various different things that you would um, in a typical render pass workflow. Um, and then at the final output, outputting the various different passes. Um, so this really encompasses a lot of things uh, that we have in the product today uh, where, you know, better ways and means to work with filing data and to consolidate the information, um, better ways to work with uh, selection sets, uh, layers, um, and those types of things that we have um, in the application today. Um, and better ways to work with batch, uh, the batch render process, um, and render elements uh, side of things within the app application today. So we're trying to uh, really focus on a new innovative workflow that ties all those things together where today they're very segmented, uh, you know, pieces of the workflow uh, and don't necessarily connect one to the other from the next. Um, so that's, that's all um, part of the umbrella of document views. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to the latter part of this uh, presentation. Um, so at this point, I'm going to take the opportunity to, uh, we'll open it up to more questions that either Ken uh, feeds me or others that are online answering questions. Um, but to kick it off, I'm going to answer a few of the common questions that we see. Um, and the first one there is, obviously when when will you find out more so we're going to try to do these pre presentations on an annual basis um, you know roughly this time of year uh, next year hopefully we'll have another great update uh, prepared for you um, we, you know there's always a chance we might do it earlier if uh, something breaks through and we have a you know even more news to share uh, but we want to try to keep you in the loop as as much as we have you know much as we can um, and we have enough information to make it relative each each time uh, the sessions are recorded, as mentioned earlier in the call. Uh, they, you will receive an email tomorrow, probably uh, tomorrow or the next day, uh, to let you know where it can be downloaded or viewed online. Uh, to get on beta, we currently are running an active beta. Um, you can uh, uh, sign up or um, you know, go through the evaluation process uh, by going to beta.autodesk.com, and there's an application you can fill out. Um, and then based upon our selection criteria, uh, you may or may not uh, get asked to be on board. Uh, we do run a fairly large beta, um, and uh, we try to make it as accessible as possible uh, to those of you out there. Um, there's a great question here coming in online. When is the first release of XBR seriously going to arrive? After the end of the world in 2012 or before? <laughs> Uh, hopefully the world doesn't end in 2012, um, but uh, you know we think that, like I said, we're we're kind of at the point where you'll start to see some you know more 
uh, more beneficial impacts of a lot of this work. For the early stages of XBR, really throughout the phase one um, process, a lot of it was under the hood. A lot of it didn't surface um, as any true benefits uh, to you as the end user. Um, and as we move further down the project, uh, those things are going to become more prevalent. Um, and so hopefully in the near future, I'll be able to have uh, more information to, to talk about there. Um, and so how is this going to impact the SDK? Well, there's some serious changes. I mean, changing the viewport engine in the product um, is the biggest architectural change the product has ever undergone since moving from DOS uh, to 3ds Max. Um, so these are significant changes, and we have to be very careful, um, you know, in the, the downstream impacts of these changes, such as the SDK breakage. Um, so we are also very cognizant of this and making sure that, um, you know, we're, we're minimizing that as much as possible. Uh, we are in an era where breaks are, are likely to occur um, every release at this point in time. Uh, we do try to avoid that, and we try to maintain a policy of breaking every other release as much as possible. Uh, but we don't want it to impede progress. Um, so we need to make sure um, the development team can make these, you know, the improvements when necessary and move the product forward. Uh, so with the graphics, we found ways to, to minimize the impact um, at this point in time. So hopefully, uh, you know, when that surfaces, it won't be a big deal for the SDK break, and it'll be as minimal, um, ideally, as just a recompile. Is this a new product? No, it is not. This question comes up time and time again. Uh, XBR is still Max. Uh, it is still 3DS Max that you know and love. Uh, we're just working on, like I said, core changes to the product to refactor, restructure it, um, so it can be, you know, the, the next great product for, or continue to be the best product out there for the next 20 years. Uh, we have a lot of passionate people behind the product, and we want to make sure uh, that it continues on its legacy that it's already earned to date. So how many releases? Well, that's completely undetermined at this point in time. And like I said, uh, it's associated to phases. Um, we're roughly coming up on where we think we're at phase two. Uh, we started talking about this project um, roughly around the 2010 release. Um, work has been occurring uh, on the project uh, for four years now. Um, so. Things have, have been slow progress to date, but um, again, we got to make sure it's ready before it actually surfaces to you. Um, and we drastically, or we desperately want to avoid creating any disruption to your workflow because we know and understand how much you know many of you depend on product on a daily basis. Um, we can't afford to create a situation as you where it completely fails in your workflow.